P.T. Good people, it's your good sister Morgan Renee Myers tuning in with you all for another story time with Maura Mai. Today we have a special request. I want to give a special thank you and shout out to Theo and A. Gray for requesting this new read, The Bluest Eye. So for those of y'all that are new to my channel, welcome. Um, I be recording on like Facebook and Instagram and uploading to my YouTube where I do story time with more of my, where my goal is to read books by black authors and about black lives or BIPOC, what is it, black indigenous people of color. Um, so yeah, so someone reached out today and asked, uh, said that they have been reading Richard Wright's Black Boy in their class and tuning along to my videos and that they enjoyed it along with my commentary and they suggested that I read this book because they're getting started on this, this is February 20th, 2024. Um, and starting in March, they're going to be reading it. So, let's get into it. I have a confession to make. I have never read a Toni Morrison novel. And definitely not all the way through. I read bits and pieces of, I think, Sula or something, but I've never. And I think one of my reasons was because I think I heard that sometimes it can be kind of difficult to get into Toni's work. And so I think I kind of let it discourage me or just say, you know, I'll get to it eventually when I have time to, like, sit down. And I've never made time. So, again, shout out to uh, the young person, Theo, in 8th grade, that emailed me today about reading this for their required readings in school. Share this video with someone that you know um, has this required reading in school or would just love to listen along. So, I'm the type I like to read the foreword, the preface, and all of that. Um, this book was written kind of strangely. I kind of went went through it first to see what's going on. So, we got it starts off with a foreword, but there's no table of contents, so I can't see what page number to what page number what's chapter one or two so in my particular copy that i got from the library today so we got a forward that's about three four pages then we have the bluest eyes and it's just like one two pages that's saying something then it just gets into another page <laughs> then it says autumn so i don't know how the students are reading this in school but i've kind of marked it how i intend to read it um, I'm going to read the foreword and the first few pages and up until the point that looks like a stopping point um, for a chapter. That's what I'm going to do and I'm going to just label the page numbers. And that's another thing. My copy starts out with really no page numbers. I had to go in and write. Like when it came to page 11, then I had page numbers. And so I just counted down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Let's get into it. I just had to explain what was going on because I don't know where the chapter starts and starts. So, the bluest eye by Toni Morrison. Forward. There can't be anyone, I am sure, who doesn't know what it feels like to be disliked, even rejected, momentarily or for sustained periods of time. Perhaps the feeling is merely indifferent, mild annoyance, but it may also be hurt. It may even be that some of us know what it is like to be actually hated. Mm. Hated for things we have no control over and cannot change. Uh-oh. Hmm. When this happens, it is some consolation to know that the dislike or hatred is unjustified, that you don't deserve it. And if you have the emotional strength and or support from family and friends, the damage is reduced or erased. We think of it as the stress, minor or disabling, that is part of life as a human. When I began writing The Bluest Eyes, it was Tony talking directly to us in her forward. When I began writing The Bluest Eye, I was interested in something else. Not resistance to the contempt of others, ways to deflect it, but the far more tragic and disabling consequences of accepting rejection as legitimate, as self-evident. I knew that some victims of powerful self-loathing turn out to be dangerous, violent, reproducing the enemy who has humiliated them over and over. Others surrender their identity, melt into the structure that delivers the strong persona they lack. Most others, however, grow beyond it. But there are some who collapse, silently, anonymously, with no voice to express or acknowledge it. They are invisible. The death of self-esteem can occur quickly, easily in children before their ego has legs, so to speak. Let me back that up. I don't know why I pause like that because I'm not prepared and I need to be. So I used to also look up words that I don't know 
and I didn't want to waste time. Okay. Let's contempt taught me a while back. I'm going to keep going with the story, but fast forward if you need to. <laughs> okay, contempt means contempt. The feeling that a person or thing is beneath consideration, worthless, or deserving scorn. So let me back up, because I had that on my mind the whole time I was reading. Okay, so when I, I'm a, sorry, I'm a, I'm a scoot back. Sorry, y'all. When I began writing The Bluest Eye, I was interested in something else, not resistance to the contempt of others. So contempt means the feeling that a person or a thing is beneath consideration, disregard for something that should be taken into account. And the example is the offense of being dis... Wait a minute. The offense of being disobedient to or disrespectful of a court of law and its officers. Oh, to uh, hold somebody in contempt. We have found that you have lied in the house. This was a contempt. Okay. So she said, not resistance to the contempt of others. Well, think of some, somebody beneath her. Not to the resistance of that. Not resistance to the contempt of others. Ways to deflect it. But the far more tragic and disabling consequences of accepting rejection as legitimate, as self-evident. I knew that some victims of powerful self-loathing turn out to be dangerous, violent, reproducing the enemy who has humiliated them over and over. So I had to go back and do that because I want to make sure that I'm understanding words as I'm reading. Um, and sometimes you can get context clues or pick up what, what's being said, but I wanted to have a, a definite understanding. So let's get into it. Others surrender their identity, melt into a structure that delivers the strong persona they lack. Most others, however, grow beyond it. But there are some who collapse silently, anonymously, with no voice to express or acknowledge it. They are invisible. The death of self-esteem can occur quickly, easily in children before their ego has legs, so to speak. Couple the vulnerability of youth with indifferent parents, dismissive adults, and a world within its language, laws, and images reinforces despair, and the journey to destruction is sealed. The project then for this, my first book, was to enter the life of the one least likely to withstand such damaging forces because of youth, gender, and race. Begun as a black, uh, begun as a bleak narrative of psychological murder, the main character could not stand alone since her passivity made her a narrative void. So I invented friends, classmates who understood, even sympathized with her plight, but had the benefit of support, supportive parents and a feistiness all their own. Yet, they were helpless as well. They could not save their friend from the world. She broke. She kind of telling us the plot a little bit, ain't she telling us? The origin of the novel lay in a conversation I had with a childhood friend. We had just started elementary school. She said she wanted blue eyes. I looked around to picture her with them and was violently repelled by what I imagined she would look like if she had her wish. The sorrow in her voice seemed to call for sympathy, and I faked it for her, but astonished by the desecration she proposed, I got mad at her instead. Until that moment, I had seen the pretty, the lovely, the nice, the ugly, and though, although I had certainly used the word beautiful, I had never experienced its shock the force of which was equal, equaled by the knowledge that no one recognized it, not even or especially the one who possessed it. It must have been more than the face I was examining. The silence of the street in the early afternoon, the light, the atmosphere of confession. In any case, it was the first time I knew beautiful. I had imagined it for myself. Beauty was not simply something to behold. It was something one could do. The bluest eye was my effort to say something about that, to say something about why she had not or possibly ever would have the experience of what she possessed and also why she prayed for so radical an alteration. Implicit in her desire was racial self-loathing and 20 years later I was still wondering about how one learns that. Who told her? Who made her feel that it was better to be a freak than what she was? Who had looked at her and found her so wanting, so small a weight on the beauty scale? The novel pecks away at the gaze that condemned her. The reclamation of racial beauty in the 60s stirred these thoughts, made me think about the necessity for the claim. Why, although reviled by others, 
could this beauty not be taken for granted within the community? Why did it need wide public ar articulation to exist? These are not clever questions. But in 1962, when I began this story, and in 1965, when it began to be a book, the answers were not as obvious to me as they quickly became and are now. The assertion of racial beauty was not a reaction to the self-mocking, humorous critique of cultural and ra slash racial phobias common in all groups, but against the damaging internalization of assumptions of immutable inferiority. Let's slow down. All right, she's throwing some words at us. Immutable. 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 Immutable means unchanging over time or unable to be changed. So, but against the damaging internalization, to internalize, take something internal, internalization of assumptions of immutable, unchanging over time, okay, of assumptions of immutable inferiority. So, inferiority that does not change over time. You're going to be always be inferior. Oh, my. All right. So, but against the damaging internalization of assumptions of immutable inferiority originating in an outside gaze. So basically, so clearly it's just a concise of what she's saying. Her her friend in what kindergarten, whatever, said she wanted blue eyes. So this young girl was already internalizing that most likely white is right. Because most white people or is no is better known for white folks who have blue eyes. And I just wasn't saying but the black folks with blue eyes. So this young girl had this perceived knowledge that I need blue eyes to feel and look beautiful. And so what Tony is getting at, the assertion of racial beauty was not a reaction to the self-mocking, humorous critique of cultural and racial phobias common in all groups, but against the damaging internalization of assumptions of immutable inferiority originating in an outside gaze. So you have people outside of you, outside of your race, culture, um, marketing, promoting, telling you what should be beautiful. And here you are internalizing all this, and this don't even come from you. That's something. I focus, therefore, on how something as grotesque as the demonization of an entire race could take root inside the most delicate member of society, a child, the most vulnerable member, a female. In trying to dramatize the devastation that even casual racist contempt, oh, they go that word again, contempt can cause, I chose a unique situation, not a representative one. The extremity of Pacola's case stemmed largely from a crippled and crippling family. Um, I guess Pacola might be one of the uh, characters in the book because she didn't name a friend. Uh, Pacola's case stemmed largely from a crippled and crippling family, unlike the average black family and unlike the narrators. But singular as Pacola's life was, I believe some aspects of her woundability were lodged in all young girls. In exploring the social and domestic aggression that could cause a child to literally fall apart, I mounted a series of rejections, some routine, some exceptional, some monstrous, all the while trying hard to avoid complicity in the demonization process Pacola was subjected to. That is, I did not want to dehumanize the character who trashed Pacola and contributed to her collapse. Well, why not? One problem was centering the weight of the novel's inquiry on so delicate and vulnerable a character to smash her and lead readers into the comfort of pitying her rather than into an interrogation of themselves for the smashing. My solution, break the narrative into parts that had to be reassembled by the reader, seemed to me a good idea, the execution of which does not satisfy me now. <laughs> so you basically saying how you wrote it is not how you, uh, let me take it back. My solution, break the narrative into parts that had to be reassembled by the reader, seemed to me a good idea, the execution of which does not satisfy me now. Besides, it didn't work. Many readers remain touched but not moved. Okay, so she's reflecting on how she wrote this book. Okay, because, yeah, you already saw. I was like, where the page numbers, where the chapters? Yeah, don't have me rearranging my thoughts. Give it to me straight. Hmm. The other problem, of course, was language. Holding the despising glance while sabotaging it was difficult. The novel tried to hit the raw nerve of racial self-contempt, expose it. Let's look up contempt again. Because I done forgot already. 
the feeling that a person or thing is beneath consideration, worthless, or deserving. For okay, so um, so I have contempt. Um, so self contempt, like uh uh-uh, uh, this is beneath me. You won't, you ain't okay. Contempt. All right. So the novel tried to hit the raw nerve of racial self contempt, expose it. Then mm, self contempt. You, you feel like that's what yourself, your own kind. Ooh. I wish I, I wish I had blue eyes. I wish I was pretty. Be, come on now. Okay. Um, the novel tried to hit the raw nerve of racial self contempt, expose it, and then soothe it, not with narcotic, but with language that replicated the agency I discovered in my first experience of beauty. Because that moment was so racially infused, my revulsion at what my school friend wanted, very blue eyes and a very black skin. The harm she was doing to my concept of the beautiful, the struggle was for writing that was indisputably black. I don't yet know quite what that is, but neither that nor the attempts to disqualify an effort to find out keeps me from trying to pursue it. My choices of language, speakerly, oral, colloquial. Okay, let's slow down. Speakerly. Now, I know what a speaker is, but speakerly. I think she made it up. Let's see. Yeah, adjective, it's an adjective, comparative, more speakerly, more speakerly, superlative, the fitting of speaker or orator, okay, then she said, oral, A-U-R-A-L, mean relating, am I saying that right? Mm. Oral, relating to the ear or the sense of hearing, so you have oral, A-U-R-A-L, relating to the ear or sense of um, hearing, and then you have oral, O-R-A-L, which is like, you know, orator, you are speaking orally, um, you go to the dentist, that's a, a oral type visit, so, oral, but she say it like oral, mm. oral, 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 A-U-R-A-L, or oral, so what's that, uh, um, when two words sound the same, but they're different, you have to know what that means. I'm not going to tell you. When two words sound the same, but they're they're different. They're spelled different, and they mean different things. What is that literary device called? Anyone put it in the in the comments on YouTube and get it right? You get a special surprise from me. Mm-hmm. All right, where we at? So, the other problem was language. One of the, okay. So my choices of language, speakerly, oral, colloquial, let's see what colloquial is sitting on. So we got oral of the ear, and then we got colloquial. Colloquial. Of language used in ordinary or familiar conversation, not formal or literary. So she's telling us that she basically, she gives my choices of language, speakerly, you know, like a speaker. Oral, where it's sense of hearing, or colloquial, which again said colloquial used in ordinary familiar conversation. So, like, you know, common day talk, you might throw a little slang in there, a little black vernacular, if you will. My choices of language, speakerly, oral, colloquial, my reliance for full comprehension on codes embedded in black culture, my effort to affect immediate code conspiracy and intimacy without any distancing explanatory fabric. As well as my attempt to shape a silence while breaking it, our attempt to transfigure the complexity and wealth of black American culture into a language worthy of the culture. Thinking back now on the problems expressive language presented me presented to me, I am amazed by their currency, their tenacity. Hearing civilized languages debase humans, watching cultural exorcisms debase literature, seeing oneself preserved in the amber of disqualifying metaphors, I can say that my narrative project is as difficult today as it was then. Well, okay, Tony. She let us know. Look, I might have wrote this book to be hard, but that's why you need to read it. Okay, so like I said, she don't have chapters, so we're going into that with her forward. So now we got the bluest eye, and I had to number the pages, so I'm on what would be page three. Again, there's no chapter, no title. We're into the story now. The author has told us what she had to tell us. Here is the house. It is green and white. It has a red door. It is very pretty. Here is the family. Mother, 
father, Dick and Jane, live in the green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane? She has a red dress. She wants to play. Who will play with Jane? See the cat? It goes meow, meow. Come and play. Come and play with Jane. The kitten will not play. See mother? Mother is very nice. Mother, will you play with Jane? Mother laughs. Laugh, mother, laugh. See, father, he is big and strong. Father, will you play with Jane? Father is smiling. Smile, father, smile. See the dog? Bow, wow, goes the dog. Do you want to play with Jane? See the dog run. Run, dog, run. Look, look, here comes a friend. The friend will play with Jane. They will play a good game. Play, Jane, play. Here is the house. It is green and white. It has a red door. It is very pretty. Here is the family. So I'm speeding up because this first page has all the punctuations, the the periods, the commas, the question marks. From what I'm seeing, just gathering context clues. It looks like this story is about to read about to read again, but there's no um, there's no punctuation now. And then at the bottom is like all jumbled together. So let's play with that. First we have punctuation. Now we're about to go into not so much. Then it's going to be, let's get into it. All right. Play Jane playing. Here is the house. It is green and white and it has a red door. It is very pretty. Here is the family. Mother, father, Dick, and Jane live in the green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane? She has a red dress. She wants to play. Who will play with Jane? See the cat? It goes meow, meow. Come and play. Come play with Jane. The kitten will not play. See, mother. Mother is very nice. Mother, will you play with Jane? Mother laughs. Laugh. Mother laughs. See, father, he is big and strong. Father, will you play with Jane? Father is smiling. Smile, father. Smile. See the dog? Bow, wow, goes the dog. Do you want to play? Do you want to play with Jane? See the dog? Run. Run, dog. Look, look. Here comes a friend. The friend will play with Jane. They will play a good game. Play, Jane, play. Here is the house. It is green and white, and... <laughs> That's why I just tried to read that fast. Here is the house. It is green and white. It has red. It has a red door. It is very pretty. Here is the family. Mother, father, Dick, and Jane live in the green house. The green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane. She has a red dress. She wants to play. Who will play with Jane? See the cat. It goes meow meow. Come and play. Come play with Jane. The kitten will not play. See the mother. Mother is very nice. Mother, will you play with Jane? Mother laughs. <laughs> Why mama laughs? She don't go play with her. Mother laughs. Laughs. Mother laughs. See father. Father, he is big and strong. Father, will you play with Jane? Father is smiling. Smile, father, smile. The See the dog? Bow, wow, goes the dog. Do you want to play? Do you want to play with Jane? See the dog go run dog run look look here comes a friend the friend will play with jane they will play a good game play they will play a good game play jane play who got time come on tony all right now we're on page five that why i wonder why did she write this like that what was in her mind why all the punctuation and then my what's going on let's keep reading see if we can get an understanding Quiet as it's kept, there were no marigolds in the fall of 1941. We saw at the time that it was because Pecola was having her father's baby that the marigolds did not grow. Why? Oh, my God. This starting off like the color purple by Alice Walker. Lord have mercy. Pecola was having her father's baby that the marigolds did not grow. A little examination, much less melancholy, would have proved to us that our seeds were not the only ones that did not sprout. Nobody's did. Even the garden front in the lake showed marigolds that year. But so deeply concerned were we with the health and safe delivery of Pecola's baby, we could think of nothing but our own magic. If we planted the seeds and said the right words over them, they would blossom and everything would be all right. It was a long time before my sister and I admitted to ourselves that no green was going to spring from our seeds. Once we knew, our guilt was relieved only by fights and mutual accusations about who was to blame. For years, I thought my sister was right. It was my fault. I had planted them too far down in the earth. It never occurred to either of us that the earth itself might have been unyielding. We had dropped our seeds 
in our own little plot of black dirt, just as Pecola's father had dropped his seeds in his own plot of black dirt. Oh, this is too much. Tony, this is too much. Too soon. Let me back up. She started off quiet as it kept. There were no marigolds in the fall of 1941. We thought at the time that it was because Pecola was having her baby's father. I mean, her father's baby. That the marigolds did not grow. Then she en she ending it off. Come out. Uh, we had dropped our seeds in our own little plot of black dirt. Just as Pecola's father had dropped his seeds in his own plot of black dirt. Lord, our innocence and faith were no more productive than his lust or despair. What is clear now is that of all of that hope, fear, lust, love, and grief, nothing remains but Pecola and that unyielding earth. Charlie Bree, love, is dead. Our innocence, too. The seed shriveled and died. Her baby, too. There's really nothing more to say, except why. But since why is difficult to handle, one must take refuge in how. Good Lord, Tony, what an opening. Okay, so now we're entering autumn. And again, I don't know how long it's supposed to go to, but I'm reading to probably about this much, which will be my page 33. So we're starting at 7, autumn. Nuns go by as quiet as lust. And drunken men and sober eyes sing in the lobby of the Greek hotel. Rosemary Villanucci, our next door. I hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> Rosemary Villanucci, our next door friend who lives above her father's cafe, sits in a 1939 Buick eating bread and butter. She rolls down the window to tell my sister Frida and me that we can't come in. We stare at her, wanting her bread, but more than that, wanting to poke the arrogance out of her eyes and smash the pride of ownership that curls her chewing mouth. When she comes out of the car, we will beat her up, make red marks on her white skin, and she will cry and ask us, do we want her to pull her pants down? What? We will say no. What in what? When she comes out of the car, we will beat her up, make red marks on her white skin, and she will cry. She will cry and ask us, do we want her to pull her pants down? Oh, like, do you want to whoop me some more? <laughs> what? We will say no. We don't know what we should feel or do if she does, but whenever she asks us, we know she is offering us something precious and that our own pride must be asserted by refusing to accept. Okay, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding this, but we're going to keep it moving. School has started, and Frida and I get, uh, and Frida and I get new brown stockings and cod liver oil. Grown ups talk entire edgy voices about Zix Coal Company and take us along in the evening to the railroad track where we fill burlap sacks with the tiny pieces of coal lying about. Later, we walk home, glancing back to see the great carloads of slag being dumped, red hot and smoking, into the ravine that skirts the steel mill. The dying fire lights the sky with a dull orange glow. Frida and I lag behind, staring at the patch of color surrounded by black. It is impossible not to feel a shiver when our feet leave the gravel path and sink into the dead grass in the field. Our house is old, cold, and green. At night, a kerosene lamp lights one large room. The others are braced in darkness, peopled by roaches and mice. Mm. Adults do not talk to us. They give us directions. I'm triggered. Do any of you ever feel like that sometimes? I know I have, and I'll get back into the story. Sometimes I feel like when I was grown, I was being talked at and told what to do. And as an adult now, and remembering my youth, and as being an educator, there are times when, for lack of children need to be in children's place, but there are times where, you know, you are the younger person. You're not an adult. There's some things that have to be implemented for your safety, guidance, you know, so on and so forth. But then, you know, just relationship building, like always being talked at, told what to do, never being asked how your day is, sitting down and hearing you out. Um, I think one of the things with me and my mom that kind of got to me was as I started becoming a teen, our relationship shifted. And whereas I started asking questions, I think she took it as I'm questioning her. And then also, I think, too, I was learning different things, and especially as I went into college, I'm learning about subjects and, and ideas and perspectives that you just haven't 
mom and there's no shade i'm not trying to say i'm better than you i think i'm more than you i'm asking questions i'm wanting to know why you think a certain way and so sometimes that can trigger adults if they're not doing their own personal work as you grow up you begin to see what i'm saying life's gonna come at you fast it's gonna be bills it's gonna be all kind of stuff grief is gonna come up on you come you people you love them maybe pass away there's gonna be a lot of things that are hitting you that you may be dealing with in your youth and so sometimes to have adults just talk at a child that can really you know affect their lifestyle you know so if you are experiencing that have experienced that can relate i feel for you but also try to find the people whether it be counselors close friends other family members that you can talk to um have people that you can trust so that you can have someone to share what you're going through and not just keep you know that bottle up all right i'm sorry let's get back to it so our house is old, cold, and green. At night, a kerosene lamp lights one large room. The others are braced in darkness, peopled by roaches and mice. Adults do not talk to us. They give us directions. They issue orders without providing information. Can't even ask questions. Just tell, just tell, just tell. And sometimes, it's an immediate, it just needs to get done. But then there are other times when it's like, well, can I, I, want, I need to get an understanding of why. When we trip and fall down, they glance at us. If we cut or bruise ourselves, they ask us, are we crazy? When we catch colds, they shake their heads in disgust at our lack of consideration. How, they ask us, do you expect anybody to get anything done if you all are sick? We cannot answer them. Okay, because their sickness is probably coming from y'all lack of attention to them. Probably didn't give them an extra blanket to see if they were cold. Probably didn't feed them um, something nutritious that they needed. Or is that season? Lord have mercy. How to, we cannot answer them. Our illness is treated with contempt. What that meant? Uh, disgusting beneath me. Our illness was treated with, she like that word, it was treated with contempt, foul, black draught, and castor oil that blunts our mind. Black draught, what's that? Is that a little, the way it's spelled, it's all ca capitalized. Black draught. Medicine. Black, a uh, senolaxitis. What is black draught used for? Um, recommended for dyspepsia, sour stomach, indigestion, sick headache, offensive breath. Okay. Oh my. All right. So some type of medicine. Foul, black draught. It sounds nasty. <laughs> and castor oil that blunts our minds. When on a day after a trip to collect coal, I cough once loudly through bronchial tubes already packed tight with phlegm, my mother frowns. Great Jesus, get on in that bed. How many times do I have to tell you to wear something on your head? You must be the biggest fool in this town. Frida, come get some rags and stuff that window. Frida restuffs the window. I trudge off the bed, full of guilt and self-pity. I lie down in my underwear. The metal in my black garters hurts my legs. What? But I do not take them off, for it is too cold to lie stockingless. It takes a long time for my body to heat its place in the bed. See, I told you they ain't had no good blanket. Once I have generated a silhouette of warmth, I dare not move, for there is a cold place one half inch in any direction. No one speaks to me or asks me how I feel. In an hour or two, my mother comes. Her hands are large and rough, and when she rubs the Vic salve on my chest, I am rigid with pain. She takes two fingers full of it at a time and massages my chest until I am faint. Just when I think I will tip over into a scream, she scoops out a little of the salve on her forefinger and puts it in my mouth, telling me to swallow. You don't supposed to swallow this vagabond? A hot flannel is wrapped about my neck and chest. I am covered up with heavy quilts and ordered to sweat, which I do promptly. Later, I throw up and my mother says, What did you puke on the bed clothes for? Don't you have sense enough to hold your head out the bed? Now look what you did. You think I got time for nothing but washing up your puke? The puke swaddles down the pillow onto the sheet, green, gray, with flecks of orange. It moves like the insides of an uncooked egg, stubbornly clinging to its own mass, refusing to break up and be removed. How, I wonder, can it be so neat and nasty at the same time? My mother's voice drones on. She is not talking to me. She is talking to the puke, but she is calling it my name. Claudia. She wipes it as best she can and puts a scratchy towel over the large wet place. I lie down again. The rags have fallen from the window crack and the air is cold. I dare not call her back and I am reluctant to leave my warmth. My mother's anger humiliates me. Her words chase my cheeks and I am crying. I do not know that she is not angry at me 
but at my sickness. I believe she despises my weakness for letting the sickness take hold. By and by, I will not get sick. I will refuse to. But for now, I am crying. I know I am making more snot, but I can't stop. My sister comes in. Her eyes are full of sorrow. She sings to me. When the deep purple falls over sleepy garden wine, someone thinks of me. I don't know how the song goes. <laughs> I doze, thinking of plums, walls, and someone. But was it really like that? As painful as I remember? Only mildly. Or rather, it was a productive and fructifying pain. Love, sick, and dark as algae syrup. Alaga? Al Alaga syrup? What is Alaga syrup? That's a real thing. <laughs> Alaga syrup. Okay, it's like this red bottle. It's cane syrup. Okay. I don't think I can really. Alaga syrup. Thick and dark as alligator syrup. Okay, now it makes sense. It low key looks like molasses through the bottle. So thick and dark as alligator syrup eased up into that cracked window. I could smell it, taste it. Sweet, musty, with an edge of wintergreen in its base everywhere in that house. It stuck long with my tongue to the frosted window panes. It coated my chest along with the salve and with the flannel. And when the flannel came undone in my sleep, the clear sharp curves of air outlined its presence on my throat and in the night when my coughing was dry and tough feet padded into the room hands repinned the flannel readjusted the quilt and rested a moment on my forehead so when i think of autumn i think of somebody with hands who does not want me to die that was deep that was a lot it was autumn too when mr henry came our rumor our rumor R-O-O-M-E-R, not rumor like you told a story. Homonym, okay? I'm, I'm going to just tell y'all. Homonym. I couldn't hold it. Homonym. Homonym is when each of two or more words have the same spelling or pronunciation with different meanings and origins. Oh, wait a minute. So I was wrong. I said, I, I was wrong anyway. Um... So what's the one that's when it's a different? How many minutes when two words are spelled the same, but you can pronounce them different? Like, um, how many? Let me see. Let me see if I say that. Oh Lord! What's an example of how many? Quail, Q U A I L, the bird, and quail, same spelling to cringe. So what's um? Trying to find what is the word. Can you get behind me? So a homophobe is where. So a homophone. Okay, I thought of a homonym. Homonym is when two words are spelled the same but have um, different pronunciations and meanings. And then homophone is one or two or more words are the same but have a different spelling. What? <clears throat> Hold on, because this is going to bother me, y'all. Homophone is one of two or more words that are pronounced the same but have different spellings. Okay. Homophone. Two or more words pronounced the same but have different spelling, and then... Homonym is where homonym is where two or more words have the same spelling or pronunciation with different meanings and origins. Good Lord. That tripped me up. Okay. Sorry, y'all. It was autumn too when Mr. Henry came. Our rumor. Our rumor. 
R O O M E R. The words ballooned from the lips and hovered about our heads, silent, separate, and pleasantly mysterious. My mother was all ease and satisfaction in discussing his coming. You know him, she said to her friends. Henry Washington, he's been living over there with Miss Della Jones on 13th, on 13th Street. But she's too adult now to keep up, so he's looking for another place. Oh, yes. Her friends do not hide their curiosity. I've been wondering how long he's going to stay up there with her. They say he's real bad off. Don't know who he is half the time, and nobody else. Well, that old crazy nigga she married up with didn't help her head none. Did you hear what he told folks when he left her? Uh-huh. Uh Oh, uh-uh. What? Well, he run off with that trifling Peggy from Illyria. You know. One of the old flat Bessie girls? That's the one. Well, somebody asked him why he left the nice, good church woman like Della for that heifer. You know, Della always did keep a good house. And he said the honest to God real reason was he couldn't take no more of that violet water Della Jones used. Said she wanted, said he wanted a woman to smell like a woman. Said Della was just too clean for him. Oh, dog, ain't that nasty? You telling me? What kind of reasoning is that? No kind. Some men just dogs. Is that what gives her them strokes? Must have helped. But you know, none of them, none of them girls wasn't too bright. Remember that grinning Hattie? She wasn't right, never right. And their Aunt Julia is still trotting up and down 16th Street talking to herself. Didn't she get put away? No, County wouldn't take her. Said she wasn't harming nobody. Well, she's harming me. If <laughs> she wants something to scare the living shit out of you, you get up at 5.30 in the morning like I do and see that old hat floating by in that bonnet. Have mercy. <laughs> they laugh. This is how black women, black mothers be talking. For those that don't know or couldn't keep up with that in the word, that's that's how that's a a a, a general gossip catch up conversation. <laughs> that's that's natural in a black household. They laugh. Frida and I were washing mason jars. So who's talking to us? Claudia, right? Frida and I. Who happened to Bacola? Let's keep it going. Frida and I were washing mason jars. We do not hear their words, but with grown-ups, we listen to and watch out for their voices. Well, I hope don't nobody let me roam around like that when I get see now. It's a shame. What they going to do about Della? Don't she have no people? A sister's coming up from North Carolina to look after her. That's where I'm from. Is she in a house? I expect she wants to get a hold of Della's house. Oh, come on. That's an evil thought if I ever heard one. What you want? What you want to bet? Henry Washington said that since they ain't seen Della in fifteen years. I kind of thought Henry would marry her one of these days. That old woman. Well, Henry ain't no chicken. No, but he ain't no buzzard either. He ever been married to anybody? No. How come? Somebody cut it off. Cut it off. <laughs> He's just picky. He ain't picky. You see anything around here you'd marry? Well, no. He's just sensible, a steady worker with quiet eyes. I hope it works out all right. It will. How much you charge him? Five dollars every two weeks. That'll be a big help to you, I'll say. Their conversation is like a gently wicked dance. Sound meets sound, curtsy, shimmies, and retires. Another sound enters but is upstaged by still another. The two circle each other and stop. Sometimes their words move in lofty spirals. Other times they take strident leaps, and all of it is punctuated with warm, pulsed laughter, like the throb of a heart made of jelly. The edge, the curl, the thrust of their emotion is always clear to Frida and me. We do not, cannot, know the meanings of all their words, for we are nine and ten years old. So we watch their faces, their hands, their feet, and listen for truth in timbre. So when Mr. Henry arrived on a Saturday night, we smelled him. He smelled wonderful. Let's send right real quick, because I know I've been doing the most. Timber. I ain't even saying it right. According to Google, timber. The character or quality of a musical sound or voice as distinct from its pitch and intensity. Intensity. Okay, so the trumpet mutes with different timbres. Tim what? Timber. Timbers. <laughs> All right. Um, so when Mr. Henry arrived on Saturday night, we smelled him. He smelled wonderful, like trees and lemon vanishing cream and new Nile hair oil and flecks of sensing. 
He smiled a lot, showing small, even white teeth with a friendly gap in the middle. Frida and I, when I introduced to him, merely pointed out, like, here is the bathroom, the clothes closet is here, and these are my kids, Frida and Claudia. Watch out for this window. It don't open all the way. We looked sideways at him, saying nothing and expecting him to say nothing, just to nod as he had done it at the clothes closet, acknowledging our existence. To our surprise, he spoke to us. Hello there. You must be Greta Garbo and you must be Ginger Rogers. We giggled. Even my father was startled into a smile. Who's Gren Greta Garbo? So, see, you gotta really sit with your, uh, this is a good way to use your phone and not be on it while you're looking up words. Because some of y'all are not going to know what some of this stuff is. Because I don't even. I'm 33 and don't know. Greta Garbo, a Swedish American actress. Okay, let's see who Ginger Robin is. So I guess he was calling him beautiful. Again, we have this whole context that only white is beautiful. Black children are um, complimenting, or black people in general aren't complimenting on their beauty. The, the beauty standard is what's being marketed, which was not black people at the time. So, Ginger Rogers, she's a, a, a white American actress and dancer. Okay. So, these must be some people that at this time was probably on her TV, you know, that they saw. So, hello there. You must be Greta Garbo and you must be Ginger Roberts. We giggled. Even my father was startled into a smile. Want a penny? He held out a shiny coin to us. Frida lowered her head, too pleased to answer. I reached for it. He snapped his thumb and forefinger and the penny disappeared. Our shock was laced with delight. We searched all over him, poking our fingers into his socks, looking up the inside back of his coat. His happiness, his anticipation with certainty, we were happy. And while we waited for the coin to reappear, we knew we were amusing Mama and Daddy. Daddy was smiling and Mama's eyes went soft as they followed our hands, wandering over Mr. Henry's body. We loved him. Even after what came later, there was no bitterness in our memory of him. Uh-oh, what happened later? She slept in the bed with us, Frida on the outside because she is brave. It never occurs to her that if in her sleep she, her hand hangs over the edge of the bed, something will crawl out from under it and bite her fingers off. I sleep near the wall because the thought has occurred to me. Pacola, therefore, had to sleep in the middle. Mama had told us two days earlier that a case was coming, a girl who had no place to go. The county had placed her in our house for a few days until they could decide what to do, or more precisely, until the family was reunited. We were to be nice to her and not fight. Mama didn't know what got into people, but that old dog breed love had burned up his house, gone upside his wife's head, and everybody, as a result, was outdoors. Outdoors, we knew, was the real terror of life. The threat of being outdoors surfaced frequently in those days. Every possibility of excess was curtailed with it. If somebody ate too much, he could end up outdoors. If somebody used too much coal, he could end up outdoors. People could gamble themselves outdoors, drink themselves outdoors. Sometimes mothers put their sons outdoors, and when that happened, regardless of what the son had done, all sympathy was with him. He was outdoors, and his own flesh had done it. To be put outdoors by a landlord was one thing, unfortunate, but an aspect of life over which you had no control since you could not control your income. But to be slack enough to put oneself outdoors or heartless enough to put one's own kin outdoors, that was criminal. There is a difference between being put out and being put outdoors. If you are being put out, you go somewhere else. If you are outdoors, there is no place to go. Outdoors sound like a nice word for homeless. You outdoors. It sounds like the facts of the way you got you outdoors. <laughs> the distinction was subtle but final. Um, outdoors was the end of something, an irrevocable physical fact, defining and complementing our metaphysical condition. Being a minority in both caste and class, we moved about anyway on the hem of life, struggling to consolidate our weaknesses and hang on or to creep singly up into the major folds of the garment. Our peripheral existence, however, was something we had learned to deal with, probably because it was abstract. Now, I know peripheral means, maybe I don't, out the side of the eye is what I was going to say. But let's see what do we got to say, peripheral. Oh, hold on, P-E-R-I-P-H. Peripheral. Relating to or situated on the edge of periphery is something, the peripheral areas of Europe. Give us some more definitions, please, because 
a secondary or minor importance, marginal. She will see their problems as peripheral as her own. When it comes to anatomy, that's the, the way I thought of it, um, near the surface of the body with special reference to the circulation in the nervous system. Peripheral. At the edge, the outskirts. So peripheral vision, I guess, is like seeing outside of your eye to edge. Um, but yeah, so situated on the edge or something. All right, where we Our peripheral existence, however, was something we had learned to deal with. Secondary or minor importance is what she means by that. Our secondary or minor importance of existence, however, was something we had learned to deal with, probably because it was abstract, but the concreteness of being outdoors was another matter. Like the difference between the concept of death and being, in fact, dead. Dead doesn't change, and outdoors is here to stay. Knowing that there was a such thing as outdoors bred in us a hunger for property, for ownership, the firm possession of a yard, a porch, a great arbor. Propriety, black people spent all their energies, all their love on their nests. Like frenzied, desperate birds, they over-decorated everything, fussed and fidgeted over their hard-won homes, canned, jelly, and preserved all summer to fill the cupboards and shelves. They painted, picked, and poked at every corner of their houses, and these houses loomed like hothouse sunflowers among the rows of weeds that were the rented houses. Renting blacks cast spiritive glances at those own yards and porches and made firmer commitments to buy themselves some nice little old place. In the meantime, they saved and scratched and piled away what they could in the rent, rented hovels, looking forward to the day of property. Charlie Breedlove, then a renting black, having put his family outdoors, had catapulted himself beyond the reaches of human consideration. He had joined the animal, was indeed an old dog, a snake, a ratty nigga. Now, wait a minute, they had called him, uh, oh, that old dog Breedlove. Okay, all right. Charlie B. Love, I guess he's the old dog. All right. Um, he had joined the animals, was indeed an old dog, a snake, a ratty nigger. Mrs. Bree Love was staying with the woman she worked for. The boy, Sammy, was with some of the other family, and Pacola was with us to stay. So Mrs. Bree Love was staying with the woman she worked for. The boy, Sammy, was with the other family, and Pacola was to stay with us. Okay, Charlie was in jail. She came with nothing, no little paper bag with the other dress or a nightgown or two pair of whitish cotton bloomers. She just appeared with a white woman and sat down, probably the foster, the CPS worker, a social worker. We had run, we had fun in those few days Pacola was with us. Frida and I stopped fighting each other and concentrated on our guests, trying hard to keep her from feeling outdoors. When we discovered that she clearly did not want to dominate us, we liked her. She laughed when I clowned for her and smiled and accepted gracefully the food gifts my sister gave her. Would you like some graham crackers? I don't care. Frida brought her four graham crackers on a saucer and some milk in a blue and white Shirley Temple cup. She was a long, she was a long time with the milk and gazed fondly at the silhouette of Shirley Temple's dimple face. Frida and she had a loving conversation about how cute Shirley Temple was. I couldn't join them in that adoration because I hated Shirley. Not because she was cute, but because she danced with Bojangles, who was my friend, my uncle, my daddy, and who ought to have been soft shooing in and chuckling with me. Instead, he was enjoying sharing and giving a lovely dance thing with one of those little white girls whose socks never slid. That Oh, whose socks never slid down her heels. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> let's back that up. So Bojangles, if you look them up, and yeah, just look up the history of Bojangles. Um, and so yeah, this black person dancing with this little white little girl, and her socks never slid down her heels. So for little black girls especially that would go to church, probably little white girls too. I don't know y'all story, but going to church with your with your your, your socks, um, your frilly socks, like was a thing, but they sometimes would also slip down, especially if they was worn, they can get under, stuck under your foot, and it's not a good feeling. So, <laughs> I hated Shirley, not because she was cute, but because she danced with Bojangles, who was my friend, my uncle, my daddy, and who ought to have been soft shooing in and chuckling in with me. Instead, he was enjoying, sharing, giving a lovely dance thing with one of those little white girls whose socks never slid down under their heels. So I said, I like Jane Withers. 
They gave me a puzzled look, decided I was incomprehensible, and continued their reminiscing about old squint-eyed Shirley. <laughs> Who was Jane Weathers? <laughs> okay. She was an American actress. It looked like she was a child actress, too. So, okay, she liked Jane better than Shirley, I guess. They gave me a puzzled look and decided, okay, younger than both Frida and Pecola, I had not yet arrived at the turning point in my development of my psyche, which would allow me to love her. Okay, so they saw contacts. Claudia must be 9 and Frida's 10, because she said we were only 9 and 10. So, okay, and Pecola. All right, so what I felt at that time was unsullied hatred. But before that, I had felt a stranger, more frightening thing than hatred for all the Shirley Temples of the world. It had begun with Christmas and the gift of dolls. The big, the special, the loving gift was always a big, blue-eyed baby doll. From the clucking sounds of adults, I knew that the doll represented what they thought was my fondest wish. I was bemused with the thing itself and the way it looked. What was I supposed to do with it? Pretend I was its mother? I had no interest in babies or the concept of motherhood. I was interested only in humans my own age and size and to not generate an enthusiasm at the prospect of being a mother. Motherhood was old age and other remote possibilities, I learned quickly. However, what I was expected to do with the doll, rock it, fabricate story situations around it, even sleep with it. Picture books were picture books were full of little girls sleeping with their dolls, raggedy Ann dolls usually, but they were out of the question. I was physically revolted by and secretly frightened of those round moronic eye mor moronic eyes, the pancake face and orange worm hair. The other dogs, which were supposed to bring me great pleasure, succeeded in doing quite the opposite. When I took it to bed, its hard, unyielding limbs resisted my flesh. The tapered fingertips on those dimpled hands scratched. If in sleep I turned, the bone-cold head collided with my own. It was a most uncomfortable, patently aggressive sleeping companion. To hold it was no more rewarding. The starched gauze or lace on the cotton dress irritated any embrace. I had only one desire, to dismember it. To see what it was made, to see what it was made, to discover the dearness, to find the beauty, the desirability that had escaped me, but apparently only me. Adults, older girls, shops, magazines, newspapers, window signs, all the world had agreed that a blue-eyed, yellow-haired, pink-skinned doll was what every girl child treasured. Here, they said, this is beautiful, and if you are on this day worthy, you may have it. I fingered the face, wondering at the single-stroke eyebrows, picked at the pearly teeth stuck like two piano keys between red bowline lips, traced the turned-up nose, poked the glassy blue eyeballs, twisted the yellow hair. I could not love it, but I could examine it to see what it was that all the world said was lovable, break off the tiny fingers, bend the flat feet, loosen the hair, twist the head around, and the thing made one sound. A sound they said was a sweet and plaintive cry, Mama, but which sound to me like the bleat of a dying lamb, or more precisely, our icebox door opening on rusty hinges in July. <laughs> Remove the cold and stupid eyeball, it will still, it will bleat still. <laughs> Take off the head, shake out the sawdust, crack the back against the brass bed rail, it will still, it will bleat still. The gauze back would split, and I would see the disc and with six holes, the secret of the sound, a mere mental roundness. Grown people frowned and fussed. You don't know how to take care of nothing. I never had a baby doll in my whole life, and used to cry my eyes out for them. Now you got one, a beautiful one, and you tear it up. What's the matter with you? How strong was their outrage? Tears threatened to erase the aloofness of their authority. The emotion of years of unfulfilled longing preened in their voices. I did not know why I destroyed, destroyed those dolls, but I did know that nobody ever asked me what I wanted for Christmas. Had any adult with the power to fulfill my desires taken me seriously and asked me what I wanted, they would have known that I did not want to have anything to own or to possess any object. I wanted, rather, to feel something on Christmas Day. The real question would have been, Dear Claudia, what experience would you like on Christmas? I would have spoken up. I want to sit on the low stool in Big Mama's kitchen with my lap full of lilacs and listen to Big Papa play his violin for me alone. The lowness of the stool made for my body, the security and warmth of Big Mama's kitchen, the smell of the lilacs, the sound of the music, and since it would be good to have all my senses engaged, the taste of a peach. 
perhaps, afterwards. Instead, I tasted and smelled the acridness of tin plates and cups designed for tea parties that bored me. Instead, I looked with loathing at our new dresses that required a hateful bath and a galvanized zinc tub before wearing, slipping around on the zinc, no time to play or soak for the water chilled too fast, no time to enjoy one's nakedness, only time to make curtains of soapy water careen down between the legs, then the scratchy towels and the dreadful and humiliating absence of dirt, the irritable, unimaginative cleanliness. Gone, the ink marks from legs and face, all my creations and accumulations of the day gone and replaced by goose pimples. I destroyed white baby dolls. But the dismembering of dolls was not the true horror. The truly horrifying thing was the transference of the same impulses to little white girls. The indifference with which I had have act, I could have asked them was shaken only by my desire to do so. To discover what eluded me, the secret of the magic they weaved on others. What made people look at them and say, ah, but not for me. The eyes slide of black women as they approached them on the street and the possessive gentleness of their touch as they handled them. If I pinch them, their eyes, unlike the crazed glint of the baby doll's eyes, will fold in pain, and their cry would not be the sound of an icebox door, but a fascinating cry of pain. When I learned how repulsive this disinterested violence was, that it was repulsive because it was disinterested, my shame floundered about for refuge. The best hiding place was love. Thus, the conversation from pristine sadism to fabricated hatred to fraudulent love. It was a small step to Shirley Temple. I learned much later to worship her, just as I learned to delight in cleanliness, knowing, even as I learned, that the change was adjustment without improvement. Okay, so that's a lot. Saying how she, you know, is viewing white young women, white people, white dolls. And I do like that. She points out, like, no one asked me what I wanted for Christmas. Because her parents didn't talk to her. They talked at her, told her what to do. You were seen and not heard. But that was beautiful. That was like poetry. I would like to sit on the low stool on Big Mama lap and smell lollies and hear Big Papa play the violin. Like, I don't even want gifts. <laughs> I don't even want these white baby dolls y'all keep giving me every year. Like, y'all see I be dismembering I ain't fooling with these white baby dolls. They don't look like me. What am I supposed to do? Be their mama? I'm, I'm nine myself. I ain't trying to be raising no kids. <laughs> y'all look like y'all struggling to to me. <laughs> Three quarters in the milk. Three, oh, that's not what that's saying. Three quarts of milk. That's what was in that icebox yesterday. Three whole quarts. Now they ain't none. Not a drop. I don't mind folks coming in and getting what they want, but three quarts of milk? What the devil does anybody need with three quarts of milk? The folks my mother was referring to was Pecola. The three of us, Pecola, Frida, and I, listened to her downstairs in the kitchen fussing about the amount of milk Pecola had drunk. We knew she had fine we knew she was fond of the Shirley Temple cup and took every opportunity to drink milk out of it just to handle and see sweet Shirley's face. My mother knew that Frida and I hated milk and assumed Pecola drank it out of greediness. It was certainly not for us to dispute her. We didn't initiate talk with grown-ups. We answered their questions. Ashamed of the insults that were being heaped on our friend, we just sat there. I picked toe jam, Frida cleaned her fingernails with her teeth, and Pecola finger traced her some scars on her knee. Her head cocked to one side. My mother's fussing soliloquies always irritated and depressed us. Mine, too. They were interminable, insulting, and although indirect, Mama never named anybody, just talked about folks and some people, extremely painful in their thrust. She would go on like that for hours, connecting one offense to another to all the things that challenged her spewed out. All right, let's slow down. So we had interminable. Interminable means wearisomely protracted. Well, what does that mean? Interminable. Interminable. Endless, often hyperbolically. We got bogged down in interminable discussions. Okay, so endless. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, interminable. So they were interminable. So let me back up because I can relate to this. My mother's fussing soliloquies. Something, but anyone, black, anyone with a mother, but the black mother, good God. 
My mother's such and soliloquies always irritated and depressed us. They were interminable, endless, insulting, and although indirect, mama never named anybody, just talked about folks and some people, extremely painful in their thrust. She would go on like that for hours, okay, connecting one offense to another to all the things that changed her. Spewed out, that's what we were looking up. Cherish, am I even saying that right? C H A R. I keep losing my spot, Lord. Okay, C H A. I'm lying. C H A G R I N G D. Chagrin. Chagrin. I said Karen. Chagrin. <laughs> Chagrined. So until all the things that chagrined her were spewed out. So she feel distressed or humiliated. So all the things that stressed or humiliated her were spewed out. Okay. So she was going like that for hours, connecting one offense to another until all the things that chagrined her were spewed out. Then, having told everybody and everything off, she would burst into song and sing the rest of the day. She had to just get it out. But it was such a long time before the singing part came. In the meantime, our stomachs jellying and our necks burning. We listened, avoided each other's eyes and picked toe jam or whatever. I don't know what I'm supposed to be running here. A charity ward, I guess. Time for me to get out of the giving line and get into the getting line. I guess I ain't supposed to have nothing. I'm supposed to end up in the poorhouse. Looks like nothing I do is going to keep me out of there. Folks just spend all their time trying to figure out ways to send me to the poorhouse. I got about as much business with another mouth to feed as a cat has with side pockets. As if I don't have a, uh, trouble enough trying to feed my own and keep out the poor house. Now I got something else in here that's just going to drink me on in there. Well, no, nah, she ain't. Not long as I got strength in my body and a tongue in my head. There's a limit to everything. I ain't got nothing to, I ain't got nothing to just throw away. Don't nobody need three quarts of milk. Henry Ford don't need three quarts of milk. That's just downright simple. I'm willing to do what I can for folks. Can't nobody say I ain't, but this has got to stop. And I'm just the one to stop it. Bible say wipe as well as pray. Folks just dump their children off on you and go on about their business. Ain't nobody even peeped in here to see whether that child has a loaf of bread. Looks like they would just peep in to see whether I had a loaf of bread to give her. But no, that thought don't cross their mind. That old trifling Charlie been out of jail two whole days and ain't been here yet to see if his own child was alive or dead. She could be dead for all he know. And that mama neither. What kind of something is that? When Mama got around to Henry Ford and all those people who didn't care whether she was a loaf of bread, it was time to go. We wanted to miss the part about Roosevelt and the CCC camp. Frida got up and started downstairs. Pacola and I followed, making a wide arc to avoid the kitchen doorway. We sat on the steps of the porch where my mother's words could, really, could only reach us only in spurts. It was a lonesome Saturday. The house smelled of Fells, Napsa. What is that? Fells. Now, the soap. Okay, it's a type of soap. Green and white brand. All right, so Saturday's for cleaning. It was a lonesome Saturday. The house smelled of fells, napsa, and the sharp odor of mustard greens cooking. Saturdays were lonesome, fussy, soapy days. Second in misery only to those tight, starchy, cough drop Sundays. So full of the don'ts and set, your, set yourselves down. If my mother was in a singing mood, it wasn't so bad. She would sing about hard times, bad times, and somebody done gone and left me times. But her voice was so sweet, and her singing eyes so melty, I found myself longing for those hard times, yearning to be grown without a thin dime to my name. I looked forward to the delicious time when my man would leave me, when I would hate to see that evening sun go down, because then I would know my man has left this town. Misery colored by the greens and blues and my mother's voice took all of the grief out of the words and left me with a conviction that pain was not only endurable, it was sweet. But without song, those Saturdays sat on my head like a cold scuttle and if mama was fussing as she was now, it was like somebody throwing stones at it. And here I am, poor as a bowl of yak me. What do they think I am? Some kind of sandy claws? Well, they can just take their stocking down because it ain't Christmas. We fidgeted. it. Let's do something, Frida said. What do you want to do, I asked. I don't know. Nothing. Frida stared at the tops of the trees. Pacola looked at her feet. You want to go up to Mr. Henry's room and look at his girly magazine? Frida made an ugly face. She didn't like to look at dirty pictures. Well, I continued, 
We could look at his Bible. That's pretty. Pretty sucks her teeth and made a sound with her lips. Okay, then. We could go thread needles for the half blind lady. She'll give us a penny. Pretty snorted. Her eyes look like snot. I don't feel like looking at them. What you want to do for Cola? I don't care, she said. Anything you want. I had another idea. We could go up the alley and see what's in the trash can. Too cold, said Frida. She was bored and irritable. I know. We can we can make I know. We can make some fudge. You kidding me? With mama in there fussing? When she starts fussing at the wall, you know she's gonna be at it all day. She wouldn't even let us. Well, let's go over to the Greek Yeah, like why do you think she's gonna let you make fudge and she she fussing about all the milk being drunk up? She wants y'all out the kitchen and not eating any extra. Well, let's go over to the Greek hotel and listen to them cut. Oh, who wants to do that? Besides, they just say the same word, same old words all the time. My supply of ideas exhausted. I began to concentrate on the white spots on my fingernails. The total signified the number of boyfriends I would have. Seven. Mama soliloquy slid into the silence. Bible say feed the hungry. That's fine. That's all right. But I ain't feeding no elephants. <laughs> Anybody need three quarts of milk to live, need to get out of here. They in the wrong place. What is this? Some kind of dairy farm? Suddenly, Pecola bolted straight up, her eyes wide with terror. A whining sound came from her mouth. What's the matter with you? Frida stood up, too. Then, we both looked where Pecola was staring. Blood was running down her leg. Some drops were on the set. I leaped up. Hey, you cut yourself? Look, it's all over your dress. A brownish red stain just colored the back of her dress. She kept whining and standing with her legs far apart. Frida said, Oh, Lordy, I know. I know what it is. What? Pocola's fingers went to her mouth. That's menstruating. What's that? You know. Am I going to die? She asked. No, you won't die. It just means you can have a baby. What? How do you know? I was sick and tired of Frida knowing everything. Mildred told me. And Mama, too. I don't believe it. You don't have to, dummy. Look, wait here. Sit down, Pocola, right here. Frida was all authority and zest. And you, she said to me, you go get some water. Water? Yes, stupid, water. And be quiet or Mama will hear you. Pocola sat down again, a little less fear in her eyes. I went into the kitchen. What do you want, girl? Mama was rinsing curtains in the sink. Some water, ma'am. Right where I'm working, naturally. Well, get a glass. Not... <clears throat> Not no clean one either. Use that jar. I got a mason jar and filled it with water from the faucet. It seemed a long time filling. Don't nobody never want none till they see me in the sink. Then everybody got to drink water. When the jar was full, I moved to leave the room. Where you going? Outside. Drink that water right here. I ain't going to break nothing. You don't know what you're going to do. Yes, ma'am, I do. Let me take it out. I won't spill none. You better not. I got to the porch and stood there with the mason jar of water. Pocola was crying. What you crying for? Does it hurt? She shook her head. Then stop swinging it's not. Freya opened the door. She had something tucked in her blouse. She looked at me in amazement and pointed to the jar. What's that supposed to do? You told me. You said get some water. Not a little old jar full. Lots of water to scrub the steps with, dumbbell. How was I supposed to know? Yeah, how was you? Come on. She pulled Pecola up by the arm. Let's go back here. They headed for the side of the house where the bushes were thick. Hey, what about me? I want to go. Shut up, Frida Sage whispered. Mama will hear you. You watch the steps. They disappeared around the corner of the house. I was going to miss something. Again. Here was something important, and I had to stay behind and not see any of it. I poured the water on the steps, blocked it with my shoe, and ran to join them. Frida was on her knees, a white rectangle of cotton was near her on the ground. She was pulling Pacola's pants off. Come on, step out of them. She managed to get the soil pants down and flung them at me. Here, what am I supposed to do with these? Bury them, moron. Frida told Pacola to hold the cotton thing between her legs. How's she going to walk like that? I asked. Frida didn't answer. Instead, she took two safety pins from the hem of her skirt and began to pin the ends of the napkins to Pacola's dress. I picked up the pants with two fingers and looked about for something to dig a hole with. A rustling noise in the bushes startled me, and turning toward it, I saw a pair of fascinated eyes in a doe white face. Rosemary was watching us. I grabbed for her face and succeeded in scratching her nose. She screamed and jumped back. 
Mrs. Matt Pierce, Mrs. Matt Pierce, Rosemary hollered. Frida and Claudia are out here playing nasty, Mrs. Matt Pierce. Mama opened the window and looked down at us. What? They're playing nasty, Mrs. Matt Pierce. Look, and Claudia hit me because I seen them. Mama slammed the window shut and came running out the back door. What you all doing? Oh, uh-uh, uh-uh, playing nasty, huh? She reached into the bushes and pulled off a switch. I'd rather raise pigs than some nasty girls. At least I can slaughter them. We began to shriek. No, Mama, no, ma'am. We wasn't. She's a liar. No, ma'am, Mama, no, ma'am, Mama. Mama grabbed Frida by the shoulder, turned her around, and gave her three or four singing cuts on her legs. Gonna be nasty, huh? No, you ain't. Frida was destroyed. Whippings wounded and insulted her. Mama looked at Pacola. You too, she said. Child of mine or not. She grabbed Pacola and spun her around. The safety pin snapped open on one end and the napkin, and Mama saw it fall under her dress. The switch hovered in the air while Mama blinked. What the devil is going on here? Frida was sobbing. Our next in line began to explain. She was bleeding. We were trying to stop the blood. Mama looked at Frida for verification. Frida nodded. She menstruated. We just we were just trying to help. we was just helping. Mama released Pacola and stood looking at her. Then she pulled both of them toward her, their heads against her stomach. Her eyes were sorry. All right, all right. Now stop crying. I didn't know. Come on now, get on in the house. Go on home, Rosemary. The show is over. We trooped in, Frida sobbing quietly, Pacola carrying a white tail, me carrying the little girl's on the woman pants. Mama led us to the bathroom. She prodded Pacola inside and taking the underwear from me, told us to stay out. We could hear water running in the bathtub. You think you going to you think she's gonna drown her? Oh, Claudia, you so dumb. She's gonna wash her clothes and all. Should we beat up Rosemary? No, leave her alone. The water gushed. And over its gushing, we could hear the music of my mother's laughter. That night in bed, the three of us lay still. Let's pause. That has to be a humiliating uh, uh, recollection of your first time menstruating. And at this point, we should be learning about our bodies and women, or people that are born biologically women. Uh, at a certain age, when puberty starts, they start to menstruate. So they can happen as early as 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15. You know, six, by 16, I think you should. That's when a woman starts releasing um, old eggs that are not going to be used to be fertilized to create a baby. And it comes out of her menstrual blood. And so that's what this young woman is going through. And that is a time, as a young woman, that you want to be comforted. It's scary. Just think of <laughs> Especially if you're a boy, you guys will never get to experience this. But, like, that is, that's scary. To just have blood come out of nowhere. So that's the time when you want to be supported and to be getting whipped. Pacola didn't get whipped, but she was about to be next in line. Like, the fact that they didn't even feel like they could go in and tell Mama, look, she's menstruating because Mama was already stressed and fussing about her drinking all that milk is, is sad. I wish they could have just went and told Mama, but that's how they found out. Good Lord, that's stressful. So that night in bed, the three of us lay still. We were full of awe and respect for Pacola. Lying next to a real person who, who was really menstruating was somehow sacred. She was different from us now, grown up like. She herself felt the distance and refused to lord it over us. After a long while, she spoke very softly. Is it true that I can have a baby now? Sure, said Frida drowsily. Sure you can. But how? Her voice was hollow with wonder. Oh, said Frida, somebody has to love you. Oh. There was a long pause on this Pacola and I thought this over. It would involve, I suppose, my man who, before leaving me, would love me. But there weren't any babies in the songs my mother sang. Maybe that's why the women were sad. The men left before we could make a baby. Hold on, let me go back. There was a long pause when Ms. Pacola and I thought this over. It would involve, I suppose, my man, who, before leaving me, would love me. But there weren't any babies in the songs my mother sang. Maybe that's why the women were sad. The men left before they could make a baby. Then Pacola asked a question that had never entered my mind. How do you do that? I mean, how do you get somebody to love you? But Frida was asleep, and I didn't know. So we're going to end there. That was a lot to take in. That was the forward, the first few pages about Jane and then the, the green white house and the red dress and all of this. So I'm stopping where I think would be 33. It wasn't numbered. 
um, where it says here's the house is green and white with the red door. Start that mess over again. We're going to end there and pick back up. Thank y'all for tuning in. Apologies for uh, if I got long-winded, looking up too much, commentary too much. I know uh, a lot of you are taking this out for your required reading, but I hope it was helpful. Um, and y'all stay tuned for the upcoming reads. Have a good rest of your day. Peace.